Hello and welcome to my talk on remote first or on avoiding video conferencing overload during times of a pandemic. My name is Isabel Trestrom. I work as an open source strategist at Europace AG. I'm also a member of the Apache Software Foundation. Now a lot of what you will hear about in this presentation is based on my experience at the Apache Software Foundation and based on patterns and best practices that we've rolled out over at Europace. I'm also co-founder of Berlin Buzzwords, which is a conference on all things search scale, scale streaming and data analysis. And typically what I would do now is to invite you to travel to Berlin in June next year and to use the conference as an excuse to make your employer pay for your trip. Now, apparently, currently, this is not a particularly good idea to travel around the world. That's why Berlin Buzzwords this year moved to an all remote conference. And the organizing company behind it, called Plain Schwarz, located in Berlin, they did a very good job at moving all of the engaging and all of the socializing stuff into the virtual and digital world. So if you need help with that, talk to them. I'm also co-founder of FOSS Backstage, which is a conference on open source, but about all of the things that happen behind the scenes. That's gonna happen virtually and digitally next year as well. Now, a lot of the ideas in this presentation are based on a talk I saw in Amsterdam at ApacheCon back in 2008. It was a talk on asynchronous decision-making by Bertrand de la Cretas. If you are interested in that topic, I would like to invite you to head over to YouTube after my presentation, go to his recording of his um, FOSTEM 2018 talk, because there you will learn many more patterns on how to make decisions and how to avoid meetings. Now, typically what I would do now is to take my microphone and ask you a couple questions, or I would do a tiny little raise your hand exercise as this is remote, that's not quite as easy anymore. And as this is a recording, that's particularly tricky. That's why ahead of this talk, I created an Etherpad, which we will use throughout this presentation in order to get you engaged. Don't worry if you didn't type the URL just now. It will be redisplayed on each slide that has a question. So let's get interactive. Remote working in five minutes. Take yourself a couple minutes and think about what is the first sentence that you think of when hearing remote first, either in a corporate setting or in an open source project setting, for instance, either regularly or now during a pandemic. Head over to the other pad and write down what your first um, bullet points, your first sentence would look like. Ready, steady, go.
ahead of this talk, what I did was to also interview a couple of my friends and colleagues and people that I've been communicating with at Berlin Buzzwords on what their experience was moving to a remote first or remote only um, work environment looked like. Let's have a look. One of the um, feedbacks that I got was I lost all flexibility. We've moved all pairing to video conference sessions and we pair all the time. So I'm still on the same schedule that I would be on at, during the office, but there's no flexibility in terms of what we do or where we have a coffee. Another one was it's exhausting. I'm in back-to-back -back conference calls all the time. So instead of making more time, this person realized that they used they also filled the time that typically you spend switching meeting rooms to fill that with additional meeting um, conference slots. Another told me it's worse than on-site meetings. What could have been an email still is a video conference. So instead of um, having accidental communication or at the near the desk communication in the office, you now schedule a video conference you have to spend a couple more minutes in order to get it all up and running. Just to exchange a few information pieces or ask a quick question. Another one told me it's chaotic. I make time for the conference call, but it doesn't have an agenda. It doesn't have any moderation. But there's also positive signs. There's people telling me I managed to get more done. There are less distractions. There's another one who told me colleagues moved to another country. Remote really works for us really well. So what's the difference between those two groups of people? Why does it work in one ha on the one side and doesn't work on the other side? During this talk, you will see a few patterns that you can use in order to make it work more smoothly. But in order to be able to transform your in-office setting, we will first look into which types of communication happen within an office. In an office, you have something like a coffee machine. People go there, make their coffee, chat a little bit, and this seems random, it seems unimportant, except that random people meet there. They do talk not only about small talk stuff, but also about work-related issues. So you do have an organic information flow within your company. You probably are pairing in order to implement new features or fix bugs. So two people sitting in front of one computer. So there's a lot of teaching happening, a lot of information exchange, and fairly intense focused sessions. So there's team communication happening at a desk. In an agile setting, you want the entire team to sit at a desk because this speeds up communication. And it clearly, um, what you observe is it's very fast to ask questions this way, and everyone sitting around can hear those questions, they can answer as well, they also hear the answers. So information flows fairly quickly. You also have something like formal team communication, say you do have daily stand-ups, um, you have sprint reviews, sprint plannings, retrospectives, etc. So you're well prepared, fairly formal, but still get people together. You typically have cross-team meetings where you do some kind of planning, um, where you do some kind of um, architecture decisions. Likely, you also have something like company all-hands meetings where there's a few people um, talking, many people listening. And of course, you've got something like lunch breaks, where either in a one-on-one -on -one setting or as a small group, you go out, you have, you have a meal together. Maybe you talk about um, non-work-related things increasing bonding between team members, or even about work-related things, um, having that uh, informal information flow again. Now, if you think about simply switching to video conferencing technology, what's easy to replicate is something like formal team communication. It's something like cross-team meetings, where you have a video conference and you exchange ideas. Likely, you have a digital whiteboard where you can move around with post-it notes. It's also easy to set up something like company all-hands meetings where you have few speakers and many people listening in. However, the informal, um, accidental communication is much harder to transform. So what kind of communication happens? 
We will head back to the other pad. I've prepared examples of what kinds of answers um, I'm after here. Take yourself uh, five minutes and think about which purposes for communication can you think of? Why are you communicating? Why are you trying to talk to your colleague? And the other question, which properties of communication think, can you think of? Is it formal? Is it informal, archaic, etc.? Which properties of communication settings can you think of? Ready, steady, go.
que a couple more seconds. So likely you found similar um, purposes and similar properties. You do communicate in order to share information, but you also do so in order to socialize. That's the coffee machine examples that we had before. You are giving feedback and receiving feedback. You're motivating people. You're trying to resolve conflicts and you're making decisions and teaching. And in terms of properties, it's maybe something like formal versus informal, what I said already. It's between, there's a difference between archived and deniable, a difference between transparent and private, and between high bandwidth and low bandwidth. And with bandwidth, I don't mean like technological bandwidth, but what I mean is how likely is it that there are misunderstandings. If we meet in person, face to face, you will hear my voice, you will see what I do with my hands, and it will be very fairly easy for you to identify if there's something ironic or sarcastic that I'm saying. You will see me smile or you see me sad. If you only read the text, all of this is left up to your interpretation. So it's much harder um, to in understand something correctly. So our goals for remote first should be to gain flexibility both in terms of location and in terms of time. If we do remote first, why um, still stick to meeting times that require everyone to work according to the same schedule and to be in the same time zone? You can be much more flexible. However, what you want to achieve is to transform office communication to digital alternatives. And not only for the formal stuff that everyone is aware of, but also the informal stuff. What you want as well is to make things as transparent as possible in order to increase innovation speed through transparency, much like we've seen during the pandemic, where um, science moved to an open publication model, which meant that um, publications came out much more rapidly and scientists could take the experience and the learnings of others and base their research work on that, which meant that progress was way faster than before. What that also means is that our organization has to become much more fault, uh, tolerant towards people making mistakes because mistakes apparently belong to learning. So you want to have a setting where people are not afraid to, to share work in progress and where people are welcoming work in progress being shared and where people are open towards spending extra effort on mentoring and explaining. As a first step, let's focus on in-project communication. Just one team, one project. If you look into the office, what happens is what um, one could call mass media. It's something like, I found a bug in module X. Go to person Y. Go to Bob. He knows best how to fix it. I found an issue with module Y. Go to Alice. She can help you. If you move to a remote setting and if you get a bit of inspiration from open source projects, that's very different. Why is that so? This one-on-one um, -on -one communication, this mass media, scales fairly well towards a team that's roughly pizza-sized. Above that, the connections just grow exponentially and it doesn't scale anymore. So what we want instead is a central hub. Within Apache, this is a mailing list, but it could be pretty much anything. It could be a GitHub project as well. So the funny thing, if you have a mailing list and you have a question, one person goes there, asks this question. Many people see the questions and everyone can participate in answering and putting their perspective to it. So you do not only benefit from the wisdom of one person, but from the wisdom of the entire team. Plus, you have many more people who potentially have the same question or didn't even think of that question who suddenly see it and see the answer. So they are learning in a drive-by way. What happens as well is that those people who used to ask that question at some point become active themselves, taking load, like support load, off of the core developers answering those easy questions as well. Now, the funny thing about the mailing list at Apache, like if you hear mail, it sounds very awful. 
mailing lists there mean it's a regular mailing list you subscribe to it. There is an archive. The archive is searchable. Each message within the archive can be accessed through a link. So you can find previous answers. Does that mean that users will go and search the archives? Often not so much. Is it still helpful? Yes, of course, because suddenly you don't have to retype the entire answer. But you go to the archive, you look it up, which is much faster, and you present the link to that answer. If you do that often enough, what you can do is to take that link and put it into a more structured documentation, documentation format. So what you end up with is one central hub and many people communicating through that hub. It's no, no longer people going to specific other people, but they go to the central hub. If it's project related um, communication. Clearly, you don't have to have only one project. You have, can have Project Unicorn with its central hub, and you can have Project Kitten again with its own central hub. Now, what can happen as well is something that's slightly more tricky if you don't have this pattern. If there's a dependency between Project Kitten and Project Unicorn, one of the developers can simply go to the central hub of Project Unicorn, ask their questions, and get their issues resolved. So you don't have the entire escalation path through management in order to talk to someone else. What can happen as well is that this person from Project Kitten stays active within Project Unicorn and learns how they are doing some things. How do they do CICD? Which kinds of um, dependencies do they have and which kinds of libraries do they use? And is that something we should do at Project Kitten as well? So suddenly there is an informal um, flow of information between those two projects. Same can happen the other way around. So what happens also is that um, people can become active not only in answering questions but also like we've got an issue we are using Project Kitten within our dependencies but we need a change to be made. We can make such change ourselves potentially with a bit of mentoring and help from Project Kitten and get it resolved without going through the entire prioritization cycle. So what you can do there very easily is share information because that's fairly neutral. What you do as well is to give feedback. You send a patch in, you get a review back. And if this review is good, it will be motivating for the person who submitted it. It works sort of, kind of well if you know how to do moderation in, in writing to resolve conflicts. Especially in the review case and in the question answering case, it also works kind of, sort of well for teaching. If you know how to do it, you can also uh, make decisions this way in an asynchronous way, avoiding meetings for tiny, tiny decisions. And if you scale it up, as we will see later in this talk, also in order to make larger decisions. Communication there is archived. It's very important. It's transparent for everyone who wants to participate. So it's not only transparent for one team, but it's low bandwidth. It will be in writing. What happens as a side effect is that you generate passive documentation. Passive documentation here meaning you capture everything that was said and you can reference it later on and don't have to retype answers. And you can take links into that archive to protect particularly influential emails and put them into your structured documentation. So essentially what you have with this passive documentation is not the final docs, but you have a very good baseline. So let's go one step further. Let's add a few communication channels. If you have a very bad conflict, if you want um, bonding between people, there's no nothing better than meeting in person. Very high bandwidth, humans are great at reading faces. So it's why we open source people also like conferences like FrostCon. It's not only about the the um, hard content that's being talked about in the presentations, but it's also the hallway track, it's also the ball pit, um, it's also having a meal together, simply hanging out together. However, it's expensive to set up. 
because it's synchronous in both time and space. You have to get people together in one location on Earth at the same time. So even before pandemic, this was already expensive to set up. It's worse now. Plus, it's not particularly durable it's because this kind of event has to be repeated for every human new to the project. That's very good for motivating people. It's very good for socializing. Everyone knows the beer event after the FrostCon Saturday. It's very nice for resolving conflict as well. I know several people within open source projects who had very um, intense dis um, discussions on mailing lists, who then during a conference met over their favorite beverage, and suddenly everything was easy and it was simple to resolve um, differences. So never underestimate meeting someone in person. It's also fairly informal, but it's very high bandwidth. Because of it being particularly expensive, I wouldn't do an in-person event only for sharing information. What else can you do? You can reduce bandwidth a little bit and do a video chat like we do now. You mostly see faces, you see less of the body language, but you still hear the tone of voice. You see if I'm smiling. But it's still fairly expensive to set up because it's synchronous in time. Everyone needs to wake up at the same point in time. We've seen that at Berlin Buzzwords, which is a conference that typically uh, spreads globe. We've also seen it at the InnoSys Common Summit, where we have pe people from Asian time zones, from European time zones, from North American time zones. Someone always has to be awake at midnight. Plus, it needs good technology. So that means a good uplink camera microphone. However, it's barely durable. Sure, you can hit the record button, but imagine having to watch all of the video chats when you're joining a new project or a new company. So it's fairly infeasible. OK, what's an alternative? Reduce the bandwidth even further. Go to online group chats. That used to be IRC. Nowadays, cool kids use Slack. Difference is not such a large thing. Yes, you do have a history. You can search it. Uh, plus, you do have a little bit of threading, but it's it's text only, except you have a few cues like someone's typing. It's rather cheap to set up, but it's still kind of sort of synchronous in time. A conversation in Slack that starts 8 a.m. in the morning and then only continues at 8 a.m. in the evening and continues on, other, on another day and yet another day doesn't feel very good. It's pretty durable. You can search it, you can skim the logs, but the logs are very, very unstructured. There's not like one topic and a few messages that belong to that topic, but typically they are interleaved. You can use a web forum, it's low bandwidth again, but suddenly it's easier to use that in an asynchronous way. Because you have um, messages grouped by topic and you can follow the conversation based on that topic. You can search it and you can follow archive discussions. Same is true for mailing lists. If you have a decent client plus an archive which has a search functionality, if you need a bit more structure, go to your issue tracker. You will find that there. However, your issue tracker still is fairly fine grained. It will be very hard to deduce the architecture of your project just looking at the issues in your issue tracker. You will need something more in order to deduce that. Wiki pages can serve that purpose as like a first step. They are well structured. And they are easy to give high-level views. If you want something really well structured, really well thought through, create a web page where you collect information not only for first-time users, not only about issues that you know about your software, but also on how to get involved, on where to find the source code, where to find the continuous integration system, where, to, where people meet in order to communicate, be it a mailing list, be it a Slack group, whatever. 
and include um, stuff like style guides or stuff like um, how to run the tests and which kind of options there are in your testing system, etc. So essentially, lesson learned here is that you want one canonical place for keeping current status. So you don't want meetings only to give status, but you want to provide status as a self-service. So that someone watching your team from the outside knows what's going on. You want one canonic place for keeping documentation in order to repeat, avoid repeating yourself. And you want one canonic place in order to track previous decisions. You want to provide your project with a long-term memory. Why did we implement feature X? Why did we choose architecture path A over B when implementing this? So let's take this a step further. How about scaling decision-making through transparency? So far, what we've looked at is decision-making and communication within one single team and across team boundaries, especially where two teams are dependent on each other because they work on components of the systems that are sort of related. What we want to do is to make decisions at a higher level now. Let's look at, it, at an example. How do we make meetings with dozens of agenda items taken hour or less? That's something that I learned at Apache Software Foundation board meetings, and it's something that it can take over to your organizations as well. So first step. Such a meeting typically has a mixture of, I want to share information. I want a decision on a tiny issue. I want a decision on a larger issue. I want to work out a solution. Make all of those agenda items available for reading well ahead of time, at least two to three days before the meeting happens. And with agenda items, I don't mean just the bullet points, but really the entire stuff that we, you would share during that meeting. And if it's multiple people that want to share stuff or that want to discuss stuff, put all of that into the agenda. So what happens is that suddenly the agenda looks pretty much like the meeting protocol after the meeting happened, before the meeting actually happens. With that protocol, what people can do is read through the protocol. So everyone can do that on their own time. They can do that while drinking a tea. They can do that um, while sitting on the balcony. They can do that in the evening. They aren't confined to one time slot. Now enable pre-approvals, like someone who agrees with, an, with some agenda item, gives them a chance, chance to mark this agenda item as, yes, I agree, we don't have to talk about it. If everyone at the meeting agrees, or if enough people agree, depending on your decision-making process, move that agenda item to done. Don't even look at it during the meeting. What we observed at the Apache Software Foundation is that suddenly an agenda that looks like this shrinks to only those items that really require discussion. Everything else people can read, decide, and discuss ahead of the meeting on their own schedule. This also means that you have to enable asynchronous communication in order to clear questions. Not everyone, everything is clear and without questions if you formulate it the first time. If you give people a chance to discuss this, these things on an asynchronous channel, the chance that items will move to the done category are highly increased. Now, does that take rocket science? Does that take awesome tooling to get done? Not really. What we use at Apache is that this um, protocol, this agenda, is being shared in a text file which is, which is checked in the version control. So everyone who participates in the meeting days ahead of time can go through that, read it, and make their notes. Now, apparently our agenda is larger than just a couple dozen 
entries. It's more like 70, 80, 90. So the text file now is the data storage backend for web frontend, which is um, remote friendly because it enables offline editing of that file and puts it in a, in a better format. But essentially, what you, all you need really is a text file that you put in version control. For communication, what does, do, what, what does the foundation use? Just a teleconference. Could be telephone, could be video conference. Nowadays, it's a combination of video conference and for those people not willing to share their video, they still have a dial-in number as a fallback. So if everything breaks down, you have a dial-in. And for the meeting itself, to make it run more smoothly, you do have a back channel on IRC or on Slack where people can communicate about the little nitty-gritty details that don't have to make it on the agenda. And it's not only nitty-gritty details, it's also a lot of jokes that make it into the back channel. Okay, taking that to the next level, we are now talking only about projects. But what about open and transparent decision making? There's a book from Jim Whitehurst called The Open Organization, which has a very nice concept. In order to drive engagement and collaboration to the roots of an organization, you need to get people involved in the decision making process. Okay, now your entire organization is a bit larger than your team of six to seven people. How do you get all of these people involved? You can't put them in the same room and get them to get them to discuss things, even if you're if, if everyone is on site. Now the thinking behind that is that making an executive decision by fiat is very fast, but that's where the real hard work, start, work starts because now change management starts. The idea is to get people involved in the decision making process, which is slower. But then you hit the ground running once the decision has been made. You don't have to convince people about it anymore because they already own what they decided. So essentially what that means is very um, familiar for people coming from the open source world. It means opening up not only the software, not only taking the package, putting an open source license to it and publishing that. It means opening up the entire creation process. That's what we have seen in Germany happen with the um, coronavirus warning app. Not only was the software published, but the entire um, creation process was visible. That means, meant that the community co could come along, file bug reports based on um, issues that they found with it and could have that fixed before it was released. It also meant that acceptance of the app went drastically up. Plus it meant you could benefit from the wisdom of the entire crowd during the creation, not only after the fact. Now engaging with those people takes a ton of time, right? It also means that suddenly you don't only have to explain what you want, but also why you want to do it. Because only if people understand why you want to make a certain change, they can make sensible suggestions to it. That means it will take slower, and if it feels overwhelming, likely someone is moving too fast. However, it's worth it. See, it's those slower decisions, they lead to better results. You can get your entire organization in, up and running with this decision making and receive more buy-in and make better decisions based on experience within various um, pieces in your organization. And a lot of that, again, is based on asynchronous decision making because you can't get all of these people in one room. Like one example is when we came up with our inner source principles at Europace a couple of years ago, what, we, what I did was to create a draft version of those principles and share them with the entire company and ask people to provide feedback and to provide improvements. When those principles finally were published, it was a no-brainer. Everyone was aware of it already and all of the glitches that otherwise would have resulted in pushback already had been ironed out. 
So what do you do for that? Again, is you enable asynchronous communication in order to prepare consensus. You don't get everyone in the same meeting room. You share your idea and you make people participate. You leverage your soapbox. You do not only share solutions, but you also point towards issues and motivate people in order to think about those issues and solve them. You share your plans, not when they are ready made, but you share them early, even if they are half-baked. Again, what that needs is a lot of trust in your organization. And it also needs that people are aware that mistakes are being made and that mistakes are part of the learning process. What that means at the organization level is that you suddenly you have something that you know from software projects already. You release early, you release often, you make small reversible set steps and that way avoid making big mistakes. mistakes. So suddenly making mistakes becomes something small and something cheap, not a catastrophe anymore. You also inspire other volunteers to become active because you share not a polished version, but something where you ask volunteers to provide their input. Now, a lot of these patterns we know already in the open source world. We've started collecting them at the inner source commons, um, which is a group of people with open source background who want to bring this kind of collaboration into the enterprise and to make companies um, adopt open source collaboration principles. We are writing those down, down in the form of patterns. You probably know them from software engineering patterns, other people know them from architecture patterns. So we do not only write down do X, but we do write down if you observe a certain situation with certain under certain conditions, you can apply this kind of change and this will lead to a situation that's different in such a way. So you, typically people go there for the patterns and for the learning path, but they stay for the community, even if they are changing organizations. Now there's a little, tiny little catch there, of course. In those comments is just one step on the journey. The goal is to train more humans in open source practices because that means lowering the barrier to get involved upstream. And it means, hopefully, that those companies who are standing on the shoulders of giants in order to solve their business cases, figure out how to help those giants, how to fix the issues that they have with these open source projects that they depend upon, that they become active themselves, not only by submitting bug reports, but by becoming active and submitting patches as well. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. And I wish you a lot of fun at the remaining FrostCon. Thank you.